uh, we had some flowers on the flower stand uh, for him, and I will, I will still take these to him. Uh, but we want to thank him for really filling in a, uh, and doing a great job on the organ for all these many months. He was been here quite a few Sundays. But he did, uh, he did take a call, a, a, um, a music job down at St. Paul United Church of Christ, I believe in South City, uh, where Tom Ressler is the, uh, the pastor there. Some of you may know him. Um, so that happened. Uh, we also have some flowers on the altar, which is uh, from Art Render Connect. These are in loving memory of, of his folks, Arthur and Bernice Render Connect. So thank you, Art, for that. Um, so I've been kind of busy this week, off and on, and it's going to continue through uh, today's the last day of General Synod which is the biannual, biannual meeting of the United Church of Christ on a national level, and I'm a delegate representing the Missouri Mid-South Conference. Uh, I'm not going to talk about that today, but next Sunday uh, I will give a report, and you'll hear a little more about what happened and what we voted on and, and things of that nature. So uh, that'll be next Sunday. Uh, some of you may have noticed that I, I and some others are wearing masks this morning. Um, and I, and I think that's going to be something, because of what's happening out there, especially with the Delta variant, that is, I think the council is basically saying, we recommend that you uh, wear a mask when you're coming and going and so forth around people. It's not required, but right now it's probably preferred, uh, just so that we can try to keep everybody as safe as possible. And, and I'm sure you've seen, you know, the numbers out there are not going in the right direction again. Um, so we need to do our part to try to keep people safe in that regard. And then I want to um, tell you, remind you, which is something I forgot to do last Sunday, which is we do have coffee and donuts and juice down in the reception room. And last Sunday I forgot to mention that, and many of you got away before I could yell and say, hey, there's donuts downstairs. So I'm giving you that heads up now. As soon as worship is over, you're free to join us uh, down there. Okay, so um, since we do not have a musician, there will be no prelude, so I'm going to ask John to ring the bell, and I guess there will be no chimes, but as he rings the bell, you may stand for the call to worship. Please join me with the, in the call to worship. As God is our shepherd, we need nothing else. God guides us along paths of righteousness. Shepherd staff, God set the banquet table for us in the presence of our enemies. There, we're anointed with oil, and our cup overflows. This mercy shall never depart us, as long as we dwell in the house of God. Okay, do we have anyone uh, willing and able to uh, begin this first hymn? It's number 594 in the red hymnal. I know, we may not know it. <laughs> uh, we'll sing verses 1, 2, and 5. If somebody will get us going.
Thank you, Nancy. That was, for a lot of that, that was sort of a solo. Did great, though. That's not a real familiar song for a lot of people. Thank you. <laughs> uh, let us join together in our prayer of invocation. Caring and gracious God, you are the shepherd who gathers us together today to celebrate with grateful thanksgiving the community in which we live. We are nourished by its diversity, brought about by the unique gifts each person contributes. Be with us in this time of worship and encourage us to never cease welcoming the strangers we meet and accepting the gifts they bring. Grant that they will enrich our lives and will be a reminder of the joy that comes when all will be one in you. Amen. You may be seated. Our first reading this morning is from Ephesians 2, 11 through 22. So then, remember that at one time, you Gentiles by birth, called the uncircumcision, by those who are called the circumcision, a physical circumcision made in the flesh by human hands. Remember that you were at that time without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth wealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace. In his flesh he has made both groups into one and has broken down the dividing wall, that is, the hostility between us. He has abolished the law with its commandments and ordinances, that he might create in himself one new humanity in place of the two, thus making peace, and might reconcile both groups to God in one body through the cross, thus putting to death that hostility through it. So he came and proclaimed peace to you who were far off, and peace to those who were near. For through him both of us have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are citizens with the saints and also members of the household of God, built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, with Christ Jesus himself as the cornerstone. In him the whole structure is joined together and grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are built together spiritually into a dwelling place for God. And now please join with me in our prayer of confession. O oh God, we live in a diverse community. There are people of different colors, abilities, and orientations. There are people on the left and the right, young and old, rich and poor. Yet our church doesn't reflect this diversity. We would love others as you do, but we can't. We've erected walls built upon our biases, fears, and insecurities that keep us apart. Forgive us that we cannot love as unconditionally as you. Help us to take down those walls so we may welcome the stranger and truly be one community together. Amen. We know that we fall short in our discipleship. We have confessed our sins before God. We look to God to repent of our sins and transgressions. And by God's overflowing, steadfast love and mercy, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. I forgot to tell you the first time, you can follow along on the back of the program with the readings. And our gospel reading comes from Mark 6, 30 to 34, and then continuing on 53 through 56. The apostles gathered around Jesus and told him all that they had done and taught. He said to them, come away to a deserted place all by yourselves and rest a while. For many were coming and going, 
and they had no leisure even to eat. And they went away in the boat to a deserted place by themselves. Now many saw them going and recognized them, and they hurried there on foot from all the towns and arrived ahead of them. As he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion for them, because they were like sheep without a shepherd, and he began to teach them many things. When they had crossed over, they came to the land at Gennesaret and moored the boat. When they got out of the boat, people at once recognized him and rushed about the whole region and began to bring the sick on mats to wherever they heard he was. And wherever he went, into villages or cities or farms, they laid the sick in the marketplaces and begged him that they might touch even the fringe of his cloak, and all who touched it were healed. Oh, oh my goodness, I thought there was another step there. That'll be on the blooper highlight reel, I'm sure. When I wear glasses, I can't see. What is that? Um, okay, we're going to try this again. Uh, hymn number 558, Savior Like a Shepherd Lead Us, and we're going to try to sing all verses. Now, I know you can sing a little louder than you did the last time. So don't wait for your neighbor to sing louder. You just go ahead and do it. So do you know this one, Nancy, or anybody else? Might as well. better. I got a text from America's Got Talent, and I'm not going to tell you what they said. Uh, thank you. Appreciate it, Nancy. Okay, I believe it's my turn. It's good we had a little lighthearted moment, because uh, now I'm going to sound a little bit morbid, and I don't mean to, to do that, but if we lived in the ancient world, and what I mean by the ancient world is, you know, before the modern world, not too long ago, if we lived in that world, we would have been sort of lucky to survive into adulthood. Uh, this is from, these are hard numbers. Research has shown and concluded that before the modern world, 
about one-fourth of all infants died in their first year of life. And almost half of all children died before they even reached puberty. Think about that. Think of your own history, your own personal history, without the aid of modern medicine. And ask yourself, would you still, still be alive today? I know I wouldn't. I would not be. Well, this was the sad reality in the ancient world. Illness, pain, suffering, and death were constantly knocking at people's doors. Few people live to be what we call elderly. And this is the context for our gospel lesson that we just heard a moment ago. The disciples give Jesus a report about their um, recent mission. And you remember this mission. Jesus had given them very simple instructions. Go out and proclaim repentance, cast out demons, and anoint the sick with oil to heal them. Does that sound like fun? I mean, let's be honest. If, if today I said, now when we leave here today, you're all going to go out two by two and you're going to proclaim repentance. You're going to cast out demons and you're going to anoint people with oil. You would look at me like as if I were crazy if I told you to do that. And I get enough of those looks already. But after their glow, glowing report of a successful mission, Jesus tells them, man, you've earned a break. You need a break. Go take one. Find a place to kick up your heels and rest for a while. Well, this proves to be almost impossible because people continue to follow them around. And this really shows the, the level of desperation in a world where illness, pain, suffering, and death are knocking at your door every day. And so the disciples, you know, what do we do? So they get into a boat to try to escape the, the needy masses. And they get it's on Lake Gennesaret, what we call the Sea of Galilee. They're just going to go and sail away somewhere else. But they're not successful. People are watching their every move. And somehow they follow them, or the word gets around, and they, people find out where they are going, and they meet them on the shore. Can you imagine leaving one mob on one shore and showing up on the other shore, and there's another mob? Now, this time, Jesus, uh, he is with them at this time. And when he sees this massive crowd gathered on the shore, rather than cursing the fact that, man, we just can't get away from these people. He has compassion for them. Now, the word compassion is, is an interesting word. Literally, it means suffering with others. Suffering, passion, with, calm, the word calm. Suffering with others. So Jesus allows their suffering to become his suffering. That's what it means to be compassionate. Now, for some reason, uh, uh, for, I guess for logistical reasons, the lectionary uh, producers did not have us read uh, the entire series of events in Mark chapter 6, which uh, the verses that Carl skipped were um, a couple of stories. One, a reference to the feeding of the 5,000. We, we missed that story. And you can envision that story being part of this larger story of the mobs following them around. And there's also the story of Jesus uh, walking on the water. And he uh, rescues his disciples from uh, the strong winds of a storm. They're worried about the boat and all that. And he calms the sea. And uh, commentators, you know, they get pretty creative trying to understand what those two stories are about. But for now, I'm sort of interested, along with the lectionary providers, those who tell us what verses to read every Sunday, uh, I'm interested in what happens next. 
The disciples, again, have gone across the lake, Sea of Galilee, and they get to the other shore again. They moor the boat, and guess what? You guessed it. Another large crowd of people meet them there. They're waiting for them. These people will not give up. And yet, it's a little different this time. Instead of just sort of idly standing by and, you know, just waiting to get a pic, you know, a view of Jesus and the disciples, many of them sort of scurry off and they bring back their loved ones who are ill, in pain, suffering, and dying. And as I implied a moment ago, that was a very large percentage of the population. So they minister to this group of people. That's implied in the story. And then Jesus and his disciples, they go off from uh, city to city and farm to farm and and, uh, village to village. And they encounter people everywhere who are so desperate uh, that they they walk up to Jesus and they they touch the fringe of his cloak, uh, hoping that they will be healed. Now, again, while reading these stories, we need to take into account the amount of suffering that always existed in the ancient world. The very high percentage of people who were sick, severely and painfully handicapped. How many of you have back problems? Imagine a world where they couldn't do anything for you. That's just one thing. All this is going on. People are dying at relatively young ages. Left and right, this is what's happening. And unless you are a war veteran, chances are you have never experienced this level of misery until COVID-19. And now... After over 600,000 Americans have died and over 4 million people worldwide have died, have lost their lives to this pandemic, we are getting a taste of what our ancient ancestors lived through every day of every year of their lives. I use the word taste with irony. Because as you know, one of the symptoms of COVID-19 is the loss of taste. In fact, I have a friend back home that has not been able to taste or smell for seven months. Going on seven months. He said it's a great weight loss program. You can imagine. And yet, even as the magnitude of these numbers sort of smack us in the face every day on the news, which has been, again, increasing. Sadly, and I don't know why, but many Americans have sort of put their heads in the sand and continue to deny the reality or the severity of this pandemic. Now, perhaps for some, I'm, I'm going to give them uh, you know, the benefit of the doubt. Perhaps for some, this is sort of a defense mechanism because drawing upon our compassion reserves is not an easy thing to do. We prefer to keep our compassion in reserve, do we not? And people understandably just want life to get back to normal, as if that's even an option at this point. I mean, it might be an option, until you or someone you know gets sick or worse, dies. But thankfully, most of us have and will survive. And if we do survive, how will we feel about that? When this all, when the smoke clears, how are we going to feel about all this? Some of us might experience what therapists call survivor's guilt. Have you heard of survivor's guilt? I mean, it's, a, it's a real diagnosis. It's in the Diagnostic Statistical Manual, um, edition four, called the DSM-4, 
which is called, this is the therapist's Bible. And in that book, survival's guilt is a form of PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. And by definition, uh, survivor's guilt occurs when a person feels bad because they survived a traumatic or tragic event when other people did not. And that can bring about guilt. So it is a very real thing among people who survive pandemics, like the one we're in now, uh, epidemics, like the AIDS crisis. Um, survivors of combat often experience survivor's guilt. Murder, especially mass murder. Natural disasters. Uh, sexual assault. Terrorism. 9-11 comes to mind. Uh, accidents. Let's say there's a big car pile up and many people die and, and you somehow have lived. And there's even survivor's guilt among the friends and family of those who have died by suicide. Now, we didn't know about this until the 1960s when therapists started noticing there were some common issues with Holocaust survivors. They were all experiencing some guilt about that. It, that's understandable. And of course, the, the very few people who survived the recent collapse of that condo in Florida will no doubt suffer from a case of survivor's guilt. If you, if you Google survivor's guilt, there's some interesting uh, personal examples, th things that happen to, to individual people that are um, worth taking note of. And the first one to me was kind of the most interesting was, uh, was Waylon Jennings. Waylon Jennings is a boy who grew up in West Texas. I, I know exactly where he comes from. I believe my nephew lives in the same place now. But as a young man, Waylon Jennings was a guitarist for Buddy Holly. And he originally had a seat on that plane that, uh, that crashed, killing everyone on board. But he gave up his seat to uh, J.P. Big Bopper Richardson. And earlier, I didn't know this about the story, but earlier when Buddy Holly had learned that Waylon Jennings was not going to fly, he said to Jennings, well, I hope your old bus freezes up. And Jennings responded, well, I hope your old plane crashes. He made that comment in jest, but it haunted Waylon Jennings the rest of his life. Survivor's guilt. Then there's uh, another one I want to mention, Sidney Aiello. Sidney uh, survived the 2018 Douglas or Stoneman Douglas High School shooting. Remember that shooting um, uh, where... Uh, 17 people were killed in that shooting. But her close friend, well, her best friend was one of the casualties. And she struggled with survivor's guilt, so much so that on March the 17th, 2019, she died by suicide. She was 19 years old. And less than a week later, another survivor of the mass shooting, Calvin Desir, also died by suicide. Survivor's guilt. It is a very real thing. And we may not think that we have or will have survivor's guilt after this pandemic is all over with. But if there's even an ounce of humanity in us, and I know there is, there will be moments when we will look back and feel compassion for those who suffered. For those who did not get through the pandemic unscathed, for those who are still feeling the effects of the virus in their bodies, for those who died, and for those who lost loved ones. And when that compassion sits in our minds and rests in our hearts for a while, we will feel a slight pang of guilt, wondering why we we're so lucky to get through the worst pandemic in a century. So I've been thinking about how we should respond to this inevitable survivor's guilt. 
And here's what I came up with. Like Jesus' disciples, we're, we're getting weary of this, right? We're tired of this. And they obviously were weary ministering to all those who were suffering in all the many ways that people suffer in the ancient world. And, and likewise, we are weary now of everything that has happened because of this pandemic and other things going on as well. And so we would also love to just get in a boat and sail away and not have to worry about any of the consequences of any of this for a while. I mean, we'd like to escape. And you know what? That's okay. That's good because self-care needs to be part of our response. If we don't take care of ourselves, we can't care for other people. So I encourage you, take care of yourselves. Do what you need to do. Beyond that, however, I believe God is calling us to turn our guilt of survival into a gift of service. Survival into service. Think about that. Think of this as sort of a second chance. You and I, yeah, we're, we're fortunate. We've been given a, an opportunity to be people of compassion, to move our professions of faith into a practice of faith, to be willing and able to suffer with others, which is what compassion is. Now that we all know really firsthand how vulnerable humanity can really be, Let's take advantage of this opportunity to show our humanity through service for others. And let's call this our post-pandemic mandate, survival into service, survival into service. So as you stop to pray or meditate this week, I encourage you to use that mandate uh, as a mantra. Say the words, survival into service, survival into service, repetitively this week. And see if the still speaking God doesn't stir up something inside of you, something that hopefully will replace your survivor's guilt with something more beneficial to humanity. Amen. I'm going to repeat some of our um, prayer concerns from the last week, because I believe there's still concerns and. Uh, want to mention Carolyn Rock, first off, having surgery on Tuesday morning. So please be in prayer for Carolyn uh, this Tuesday morning. Uh, Carol Shen's daughter, Susan, is still in the hospital, so continue to pray for her. Uh, continue to uh, pray uh, for Pat Pease, Pat Pease. And then uh, Kathy Kaltbrenner's Kalt nephew, Colin. You need to pray for him as well. Let us pray. Our gracious God, we we pause at this moment for a time of, of rest and renewal. The world is so much in our faces, and we frequently lose our sense of perspective. Sometimes we engage in hurried and frenetic activity simply to avoid having to look inward. And other times we simply are just stressed out by all the the commitments in which we are engaged. So help us to follow Jesus' example and find those places uh, of quietness and, and restfulness. Help us to assess the direction our lives are going and and to change course if we need to. 
Help us to find time to nurture the interior journey of our spirits and to make moments when we can be in touch with, with you, the eternal. Help us with the psalmist to know that the number of our days is finite. We are only on a journey. Help us not to, to fear the quiet and the silence, but instead to see it as a time for centering our lives once again. Help us when we have found a quiet place, we've rested for a while, to go forward again to reach out in service to this world full of people and needs. We pray specifically for the needs, the needs of those who need healing or peace of mind this morning. For Carolyn, Susan, and Pat, and Colin and those that we may be thinking about in our minds at this moment. May you give them rest from their anxieties. For oh God, we often feel that the needs of the world are so overwhelming. Help us not to diminish what we might do because of our lack of expectation. Enhance both our vision and our will. Help us to reach out to alleviate the world's suffering. Help us to put our influence on the side of those needs, to use our voice to make our wishes known in the, the larger arena where decisions are made by powerful people and affect others. Help us to give and to share generously where and when tragedy strikes. And help us to be open to the hurts of others whom you put in our path each and every week. In all these ways, help us to have compassion for your needy children and be also with all who need your special graces this day. We pray this in the name of the one who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Give us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Okay. Do we know this next hymn? Not really? Pick one. Who's, who's got one? Something we all know. <laughs> Did I hear 214? Well, let me see. Well, I think we know Rock of Ages, don't do we not? Um, yeah, let's sing let's sing the first and last verse, Rock of Ages. And somebody start it off. Thank you. We should have done that from the very beginning, right? Say, pick a hymn. Thinking, uh, think of the beginning of the 23rd Psalm and the words we pray every week. Give us this day our daily bread. Taken together, God promises to provide us with what we need to live today 
so we may see tomorrow. When we think of what we actually have, though, we have more than enough. We give, therefore, honor and thanks to God when we make our generous offering from our abundance. If you would please join with me in our prayer of thanksgiving. Thank you, God, for the ministries of the people of your church. Thank you, God, for the bounty of your blessings you have poured out upon us. We have taken a portion of our abundance and given it to you in grateful thanksgiving. Consecrate this offering. May it help to support the ministries of this church that will dismantle the walls that divide us so all people will be one in the new family gathered in Christ Jesus. Amen. Jesus taught us that when we welcome the stranger, we create a new community where all are one in God. Let us continue the work that Jesus started by welcoming the strangers who cross our paths, knowing that God is with us and protects us as we pursue our ministries of healing and hope. Proclaim God's glory through your work. You may go in peace. And I want to remind you that we do have coffee and donuts and juice downstairs. I'll meet you down there. <laughs>